I'm going to piggyback on Mark's announcement about our worship night in, in a few weeks. Really, it's, it's wonderful uh, that churches can get together. Uh, while we have some different doctrine and different traditions, uh, it's great to be able to major on the major and don't worry about the minor things. And to know, it really does, what it does, folks, it's, it helps us to reduce the us versus them. You know, that we've got it all wrapped up in a nice little package of what we believe and how we practice and put this all on the same page. So, uh, again, I invite you to come out here. We will have a a good time and realize that God is using a whole lot more people than just just new life. Well, hey, you know, it's been uh, a couple years since I started here at New Life, and I shared last week that I had lost my iPhone while on vacation. And so I survived the trauma of almost 10 days without a phone, and I've also made, for the first time, a trip to LAX airport without a GPS. I got there and back. I didn't get lost. I didn't panic. But I tell you, if the 605 or the 105 ever close, I'm in big trouble. Uh, So again, let you know that uh, all of us can can learn some some new ways and can figure things out once in a while. So uh, again, we are here, and I trust that you are following along in this this series on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's been an interesting journey, uh, at least for me. And I trust it has been for you folks as well. Now, we have spent several weeks, and we are just diving into, again, one of the most famous uh, sermons, uh, famous lessons that Jesus had taught his followers. And it's interesting that it isn't one of the most uh, uh, easy lessons that he taught his followers. It definitely wasn't a uh, uh, soft on theology, soft on behavior approach to his followers. He was, he was uh, pretty well out there. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about the idea of sharing Jesus with others, the idea of being a salt and light We've talked about the relationship of the Old Testament and the New Testament and and with believers. We've talked about subjects like anger and murder and having right relationships between each other and having right relationships between those that we don't really like. We've talked about lust, about flirting, about marriage, adultery, divorce, and remarriage. We're even reminded about telling the truth about taking oaths, about loving our enemies and not retaliating, which is a whole lot easier said than done. We've talked about living lives of generosity and having a pure heart when we pray and when we give, and even in our own prayers to make sure that we're really doing this in our prayer life to talk with God, not to show off our our big words. We've talked about anxiety and trusting God with our everyday needs, about judging others and how, that, and, how that, and how we deal with conflict. Boy, a lot of stuff. As I ran through this several times over the, over the past week, I'm, I can get exhausted just thinking through those subjects that we've touched on. And there's a common thread that I see throughout the entire Sermon of the Mount. And in fact, it's not overly theological, it's pretty simple. It's that this, t- this stuff is pretty tough. Most of us struggle with it one way or another, at one time or another, and depending on what relationship we're in. And that really, on our own strength, it is impossible to live out this Sermon on the Mount. Now, we've entitled this A, a New Way to Be Human. And in my typical, sarcastic, witty self... I thought maybe we should, have, we should have entitled this, You've Got to Be Kidding. Or a difficult way to be human. It just isn't easy. But we're not done yet. A couple more weeks and we'll wrap this up. So let me pray. Thank you, Lord, again for, for your presence here in this place and, and for all the different people those who have changed some of the routines and, and have showed up. And I know for some it may be tempting to, to sleep in on a Sunday, but they're here. And so I thank you. 
I know for some that they come with, with a lot of different burdens on their heart and concerns and pressures. And so I'm thankful that they didn't, didn't focus on those today, but they've taken the step to be here uh, with your people. And so I pray that the thoughts that are on their hearts and in their minds and that the words of my heart, the words that come from my heart will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So we're going to dive into a very interesting passage to begin with. It's on page 679 in that Bible in the chair in front of you. Again, if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that. Uh, but let's take a look. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7. And we're starting with verse 6 this morning. So let's take a look at, at, at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. When I read this, I thought, you know what? DJ, the guy who spoke last week, I should have made this a part of his passage. Because, you know, it's just like, what an interesting passage. I think most of you know, uh, the only dogs I love are dogs that don't belong to me. So I could say I'm a dog lover. But, you know, I just, I don't have time. And so I read this, and I'm thinking, oh, is, is Jesus not a dog lover? You know, maybe I'm just like Jesus. And he wants nothing to do with dogs. No, uh, that isn't what Jesus is saying. Uh, but in their culture, you know, dogs and pigs are really uh, uh, a symbol of, of, the, of an outcast. In fact, the Jewish culture was, was considered as bad as a dog and pig. They were scavengers, the dogs and pigs. Uh, uh, a sign of, of neglect, of rejection. And so this is interesting because many of us have, if you've grown up in the church, it depends on who you listen to when you're not in church on Sunday, uh, if you listen to any other preachers, some will say, take every advantage you have and, and share the gospel. I used to travel and, and speak in high schools uh, to students, and I would speak on relationships. And I had several people would say to me, Juno, you know, just... You know, do a bait and switch, you know, get the approval from the administration to talk about relationships, but then talk about Jesus. And I'm like, nah, that really quite isn't my style. I finally earned their trust and respect. I'm going to honor that and what I share about. But their attitude was, give it to them no matter what. This verse sort of reminds me of that. It reminds me that uh, there are some people that, depending on their situation in life, they can't handle the gospel. Or for some of you, some of your friends, some of the people you work with, they've been so fed up with the gospel. They've been so abused by the gospel. They've been so hurt by people who go to church and who love Jesus. Saying one thing to them just puts them over the edge. And that's why we often talk about being missional. We talk about building a relationship, building the right to talk about one of the most deepest subjects in all of life, and that is your relationship with Jesus. And now some have the gift of evangelism, I know, and that is wonderful. But to me, this verse is a reminder to be careful that we take something as precious, the pearls talked about here, and as precious as the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that we are wise and discerning who we share that with. Because unless we've built that relationship, we often have no idea if they have just been fed up to hear with the good news about Jesus. And that for whatever reason, uh, whether it's abuse or being hurt or being rejected by, quote, the church, once you say one word... And they just turn you off. And so to me, this is a reminder. A reminder that we need to be in prayer about sharing our faith. And that we need to be asking for discernment. And we need to be asking for that right door, that, white, that right window of opportunity to mention, to talk to because the relationship is there. 
to talk to, one of the, uh, to talk to somebody about one of the most important things in life. So when I looked at it from that perspective, I thought, oh, that verse isn't that bad. But I, when I looked it up a couple weeks ago, I just thought, oh, isn't this a weird passage? Well, let's, let's continue. And I think the, the rest of the passage uh, reminds me of, of final exam week. And for some of you, that's been a lot longer ago than others. Or let's just say you're, you're at work and, you know, responsibilities and deadlines are, are piling up. And, and you're just like, how in the world am I going to get things done? And if, you, and if you're in exams, you know, uh, the papers are due, the, the review of the entire semester is due, and you're thinking, how, how am I going to do all this in, in a week? And, and there's hours, and you're supposed to have study time the week before, but that doesn't really happen. And you're just feeling the pressure, and it's there, and you don't know what to do. You have no idea how you're going to get to it, through it and to it. I think that's a little bit of the, the Sermon on the Mount. Because if you, again, list all those things we've talked about, it's almost like, how are we going to do it? There is no way I can do these things. And yet, as in your exams, the prof will say, hey, you know what? Rather than that 20-page research paper citing 10 references, you know, why don't you go watch this movie and give me a reflection paper? Just make it two pages on how that movie uh, connects with the subjects we talked about. And you're going, oh, I can do that. I can watch a movie, and I can type anything for two pages. You get a little bit of a breather. You get a little bit of a space, or you get some of those assignments done at the office, and you're starting to see light at the, tun light at the end of the tunnel. The rest of our passage today in, in Matthew 7 reminds me that there's light at the end of the tunnel. It reminds me that, hey, we get a breather in this huge list and this huge uh, sermon of how to live in a new way. Some of this is very familiar to, 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 to many of us here. And so let's look, take a look at uh, verse 7 in Matthew. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Wonderful passage. Some of you probably claim that when you pray daily. Some of you go to God every day in prayer because of this passage. In understanding this, it's, it's helpful to know that uh, the words ask, seek, and knock are, are commandments. And they are written to imply a continuous action. So this is encouraging for me because it says yeah, I have to keep asking. I have to keep knocking. I have to keep seeking. It, prayer isn't just a, a one-time deal. But it's continuous. And it has to happen often. And yet on the face of it, it looks, at, it looks as though whatever we ask for, Whatever we seek, whatever door we are, are looking for, that God will give it to us. Because it says so right here in the New Testament. Some of us have, have heard of some theologies that's called the prosperity gospel. Some would even call it the health and wealth gospel. And and you know what that is. It's that they're saying you, you name it and you claim it, then Jesus gives it to you. I've heard pastors say, you know, you give $10 and God will give you that tenfold. And so call in on this number and give your $10. And no doubt, they raise a boatload of money that way. They live in huge homes, and they drive very nice automobiles. They also will say that if you aren't financially successful, it's because you haven't used this verse we just talked about. Ask, seek, and knock. 
that it's, your, it's a result of your faith. And that if you're in poor health, that's also a result that you haven't asked. That you have little faith, and therefore that's why you're sick. Now, I'm trying to be politically correct here, but if I was taking a walk in a public area and had stepped on something from a dog, I would probably have to do this. And that's just what I think about that prosperity gospel. That isn't what Jesus is talking about here. See, we have to take it in the context of the whole Sermon on the Mount. We just can't lift it out of that page because, again, we could all come up with, we could, you know, I didn't find my phone, and I prayed for that phone. Even with locate my iPhone, I still couldn't find it. I should write Apple about that. But anyway, uh, no, there are things we've all prayed for. You've seen your loved one die. Your kids have made horrible decisions, and you have been on your knees day after day after day praying for them. And they still make an unwise decision. So I don't think, I don't interpret this verse as saying that's because you have little faith. Because you haven't prayed hard enough. As we look at the Sermon on the Mount and take this verse in context, we take it in context that, you know, it's not the first time in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus talks about prayer. He talks about it just a little chapter earlier. We talked about this a few weeks ago in the Lord's Prayer. Let's take a look at that, Jacob. Most of us probably know the Lord's Prayer. This is how you should pray. Again, some call it the Disciples Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Folks, ask, seek, and knock needs to be understood in the context of the Lord's Prayer. And we know from a few weeks ago that the beginning of the Lord's Prayer is talking about God and, and his place in this world. Remembering that he is the creator. And then the uh, rest of the prayers are really talking about our, li our living, our life. Give us this, our, give us, say, our daily bread. Help us to forgive others. So when we ask, as we continually ask, as we keep seeking, as we keep knocking, these are the things that we should be asking and seeking for. Because we all need to be reminded of who God is. Because in our culture, there are a lot of other things that would like to replace our God. We need to be continually seeking right relationships. We need to be continually seeking and reminding ourselves that it is God who gives us our daily bread. We need to be continually asking and seeking and knocking for a heart of forgiveness. Because while we may feel we are forgiven, and while we may know as a believer in Jesus, yes, I'm forgiven, we still have a hard time extending that to the person next door. We have a hard time extending that to our colleague or to that family member who just is a creep. And I'll leave it at that. So as we think of, of asking, seeking, and knocking, let's continue to do so in the context of, of what God really meant for us to ask and seek for. Now again, it doesn't say there's anything wrong with asking and praying for, uh, for that deal to come through. To be able to get that car or to finish your education. There, there's nothing wrong. This doesn't say anything, there's, there's anything wrong with wealth. But just, I don't think it says that's what we should be praying for and asking for. Hey, let's take a look at uh, verse, verse 9 here. Which of you 
if your son asks for the bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. Let's, let's keep going, Jacob. Okay. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Again, again a, a great lesson on, on parenting. A great lesson probably on common sense for most of us. And, and even if, if you've had a, a bad dad... Most parents will feed you. Well, they may feed you McDonald's versus a healthy meal, but they'll still feed you. Again, Jesus is not politically correct here when he says, though you are evil. Well, he didn't sugarcoat that one either. Because even though we've received his love and received his grace at the core of we're evil without Jesus. But if we're able to still give, give, at least give food to your son or daughter that ask, how much more will God give to you? I think it's just a, a, a great analogy because it also reminds me of, of, and I'm sure you've been, not sure, but well, I know some of your stories. I know your spouses you're praying for, your kids you're praying for, your friends. I know some of you have wept deeply because of decisions they've made and they currently make. And yet this reminds me that God weeps more than you and I will weep for our loved ones. If we who are evil can show that much compassion, how much more will the God of creation Weep. How much more is he, is he also willing to extend his, his arm of love and grace to your loved ones? So this is a great reminder that even though we're evil, it's, it's interesting. You know, again, the Sermon on the Mount, you love Jesus. Go, go get him. Let's go out there and change the world. A new way to be human. We're reminded that without Jesus, we're evil. And so then let's take a look at that very last verse. So, in everything do to others what you would have them to do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Folks, this is not the gospel. Now, some will say, hey, if all you do is do to others as you want them to do to you, you're living a good life. Oh, you may be doing some good things, but you could be doing some good things and still not love Jesus. You could be doing some good things and still ignore the creator God that is talked about, again, in the Sermon on the Mount. Some would say this verse here is, is the uh, thesis, or it's the, it's the pinnacle point of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And you know it's not the negative. Well, he doesn't say don't do to others as you don't want them to do to you. It's really a call to action. It's a call to get off our chairs and do something good. It's not a call to sit back and comfort and not do some bad things because you don't like people treating you bad. But it's a call to be positive wherever we're at. So, of course, that means here. Of course, that means back at school. That means in the workplace. That means in your home. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And why do we do that? Uh, folks, I go back to saying, you know what? I'm evil enough to know I wouldn't just do that. Because it is a doggy dog world out there. And at times I don't feel like doing good unto others. It's just me. It's just my humanity. 
But as we've read through the Sermon on the Mount, it's a constant challenge to look at our humanity in a new way. Hence, a new way to be human. And it's just not to, to be a nice neighbor. It's just not to have people wave at you that you know them in the store that you keep going to. It's really for the opportunity to build that relationship and for the opportunity that when it's right, they will say, what is it about you? Or when the stuff of life hits the fan for them, they're going to say, you know, you've invited me before to your church. Can I tell you about my husband? Can I share with you what's going on with my wife or with my kids? Or I just got laid off. I need help. Can I ask, you know, you just, I know you're, you're different than some of the other people. So those are the opportunities that we look for. Oh, they may not happen instantly as you walk out this door. But I think if we're continually, if we continue to ask, if we continue to seek, if we continue to knock, that God will open these doors, open these doors of relationships that will allow us to share who Jesus is and to be new life for the city. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder of, of who you are. Thank you, God, that, that you don't, don't just leave us as, as evil people, sinful people, but, but that with the power of your Holy Spirit, you can change our hearts, that you can help us to forgive, that you can help us to, 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 uh, to, to be a light in a dark world. And again, not for us, God, but for, for your sake for the sake of your love being able to be shared with others. And so thank you for that reminder this morning.